Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. Good morning. The psalmist proclaimed, Our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God.
Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with confidence. Why do we pray together? We are a community. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. If one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Let us offer our prayers in unison. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all on this holiday weekend. It's great to have you here. Well, as y'all know, we are working on our upstairs and getting it ready for Sunday school, which starts next weekend. And one of the projects that I have going is a tree, a family tree of faith. We've been talking about it with the adults and talking about it with you guys. And what we're doing is we are writing our names on handprints. And those handprints are going to be the leaves of our tree. And what it shows is all the people in our family of faith. This is a family. Did y'all know that? It's a big family of faith. And all of the people that are going to be on that tree are the people that support and love each other and that we walk together. It got me to thinking about hands. Now, I know that sounds a little odd, but look at your hands right now. You see them? Now, these hands are the hands that you're going to have for your whole entire life. Think about that. And think about all of the things that your hands do. Now, these same hands that I have right here are the hands I had when I was little, and I used to color with them and make things with them and dig in the dirt with them and all the things that kids do. But also, since I've grown up, these are the hands that I used to hold my husband's hand when we got married and to hold my children when they were born. 
yes? And I've held the hand of people when they've gone to heaven and they've crossed over to see Jesus. These are the hands that have loved and created and made lots of dinners and done all of those things. And what they are, are tools that God gave me to create life and to show love. And he gave each and every one of y'all the same thing. You know, after Jesus was crucified and rose again, do you know what happened? He went to his disciples, and one of them in particular, Thomas, did not believe that he was the, the risen Christ. And you know how Jesus showed him that he was? Do you guys know? He showed him his hand. And what was in his hand? Do you know, Liza? No. Love was in his hand. But it showed there was a hole where he had been crucified. And that's how he showed. That's right. They put a nail. And that's what showed Thomas that that was actually Jesus, the risen Christ. With these hands that Jesus has given you, you can do great things. You can create, you can show love, and you can give to others, which is what he calls us to do. Our scripture today is from Matthew, and it's a really neat story, and there's a lot of good stuff in it. So I'm anxious to share it with you when we get upstairs. But first, let's use our hands. Let's put them together or raise them up, and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. You guys are quiet today. Help us to use our hands and our hearts to glorify you. In Christ's name, amen. Ooh, that was a quiet prayer. We're gonna have to kick it up a notch when we get upstairs. Are y'all ready? Cool, let's take our hands and feet and head on up. Good morning. It is good that we are here and we are uh, able to worship together and to use our hands. Um, I would uh, wel I welcome you all. I ask you to use your hands and take the pew pads that you find in the uh, pew rack and near the aisle and celebrate the fact that we're here together by placing your name and contact information about things that are going on uh, with you so we can uh, share things going on here at the church with you. I want to welcome those of you who are worshiping via television, the congregation gathered at Spring Harbor, as well as uh, wherever you are across the Chattahoochee Valley or regions uh, joining us in this time together. It is good that we are here to worship together. I want to um, highlight some things that are going on. First of all, you may notice this room is a little different today. Um, if you hadn't noticed, this is the first time in over a year that all of our windows are back where they have been. We have uh, the stained glass uh, window installers have uh, are, are almost completed. There's still some detail work that they have to finish up, up but uh, we will be having the dedication for these windows on S September 24th. Uh, please mar mark that and know that it'll be a wonderful time uh, that we're back in this space uh, together to, sh to share that time. Uh, this coming Wednesday night at uh, Wednesday night program, we will have uh, the beginning of our fall program with children's and youth activities, as well as uh, our guest, missionary guest, Ellen and Al Smith. They have been here before. They serve in Eastern Europe and in Russia, and they will be sharing news about things that are going on there. So please make uh, put that on your uh, calendar. If you are going to come, please, uh, if you would, return the reservation a card that's in the that's in the bulletin, so we can prepare for uh, the uh, for the meal for that time. Um, next Sunday is our kickoff Sunday. Um, our Sunday school classes will all be back in full force, um, children and youth, and then there will be two adult classes as well. That afternoon, we will have in the parking lot of uh, the family fun day. There will be a group the a cookout and wonderful activities. And somebody keeps telling me there's going to be a dunking booth. Don't know about that, but, you know, uh, come, and, come and see what will happen. Um, it will be a, a great day to, to be here. Also, next Sunday, we will ordain and install um, our officers for the coming year in worship, as well as have the presentation of second grade Bibles. Um, this week, of course, there has been so much information about uh, 
the results of Hurricane Harvey and the, the ongoing pieces of that. There is some information in your bulletin about uh, one way to respond to that. There are, I know, any number of other ways as well, but we lift those up to you. The Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is a, a worthwhile, incredible agency that has done good work um, around the world and around the United States. So I lift those up and commend those to you. Um, as we prepare our hearts to hear Scripture read, let us join together in singing the hymn for illumination. First reading of Scripture this morning comes from the book of Exodus. It speaks of God's uh, revelation to Moses uh, from a very unlikely place. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He held his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame a fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was ablazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that Moses turned to see that the bush was not burned up, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Rem remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the country of the Canaanite, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign for you that I will have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, I have come to the Israel, I, if I come to the Israelites, and I say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord.
The second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, in the 16th chapter. Let us listen that we may hear what God will say to us. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned to and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to follow, become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will it, they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. What are the places that God shows up? Where are they? How do we know when we are in that place? As I thought about and prepared for the service today, the scriptures of Moses in the wilderness as he stood before a bush that was burning but did not burn up, and the place of seeing Jesus teaching his disciples about the power of life, even as it confronts death. Those places spoke to me as places where God shows up. God shows up in the wilderness, at the burning bush. God shows up on the cross. And then I turned on the TV and watched the news on the Internet, and you know what I saw. Harvey all the things about the devastation of the flooding and the hurricane and the storms that were battering so much of our nation, Texas, Louisiana, and up into the middle part of the nation with torrential rains. I know that there are some of you who have family and friends, work colleagues that have been touched by the storm, and I know there are we all don't know how we are all touched in so many other ways by people who are here. And we are rightly concerned with what is happening as an immediate response to save people from those times and places. Those times are critical. And at the same time, we also know that what has been done so far in terms of an emergency response is but a small down payment on what will need it to be done for years to come. Moses encountered God in a way that is a reminder that even in places where we seek not only to mind our own business, we are touched by God's presence. We find ourselves confronted with the reality of, of the Lord's rea uh, presence with us when we don't even think about it or don't expect it. Moses had fled from Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian. He had wandered into the land of Midian, and there he married a local girl, Zipporah, whose father, Jethro, gave him a job as a sheep herder. And that's what he was doing. He was tending the flock out in the middle of nowhere, minding his own business. And as he was out there minding his own business, doing nothing else, he had an encounter with God. It was profound, this encounter. And from it, Moses learned that he was to become a leader. He was to raise up 
the children of Israel and to deliver them from their bondage and their captivity in Egypt and lead them to a new place, a different place in the world. It sure sounds like Moses wasn't too sure about this calling that he had received. He asked, how are people going to know that I am the one that you claim I am? How, how do I say who sent me? What, what, what do I, what, what's your name even? And what if the Egyptians don't believe me, but certainly what about the Israelites? It's been a long time since I've been home. Will they know me? And the Lord gave Moses this assurance. He gave him a plan and he gave him a destination. Come out of Egypt And when you do that, you come back to this place. But Moses presses on. Who is it that is sending me? What do I say when people ask me, who sent you? And the Lord replied, the one who is with your ancestors is the one who sends you into the future. And so he went back. From the boondocks, the Lord appeared and gave Moses a charge and a commission. In the middle of nowhere, that's where God showed up for Moses. In the gospel reading today, there's also a story about God showing up in an unlikely place. Jesus had been traveling outside of the territory of his Jewish homeland. He had wandered over to Tyre and Sidon. He had come back to the land around Galilee. He had asked his disciples, he said, who is it that people say I am? And some said John the Baptist, some said this prophet or that prophet, but no, then Jesus drilled down, who do you say I am? You disciples, you guys are following me. Who do you say I am? And Peter piped up and said, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ, you're the Savior, you're the one that was proclaimed about. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right, but don't tell anybody just yet. Hold that really special piece of information. And then Jesus goes into this teaching that I read, and he said, there's going to be difficulty here. There's going to be a cross. There's going to be death even. And Peter went, whoa, wait a minute, Lord. Wait a minute. That's not part of the deal. Jesus rebukes Peter in very strong terms. Get behind me, Satan. Get out of my way. You're a stumbling block here. You have no idea how God works. That's what Jesus says. You're not really, you think you know, but there's more for you to learn. The way to God is through the cross. To find our life, we must lose it. That is the place that God shows up. Often it is when we lose something that we find out how precious it really is. Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk in the 20th century here in the United States. You may have heard of Trappist monasteries before. They they are known for producing good products. They they produce cheese, they produce bread, and they produce beer. Not all of them, but some of them do, and it's quite quite remarkable. And um, there's even a Trappist monastery here in Georgia, um, up near Conyers, called the Monastery of the Holy Spirit. They do not produce beer, oh, by the way, but... Um, They do have bonsai trees, and it's a wonderful place to go and uh, meditate or to pray, to to share your life. It's, It's a remarkably peaceful place. Merton um, had grown up on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, His his growing up and, and coming of age time was somewhat tumultuous. He had a very dramatic and and, uh, significant uh, conversion as he decided to leave his life, his very enjoyable, what what many people would call enjoyable life, and enter into uh, the monastery. And 
to do that requires a, a, a long series of preparations. And as he did that, he thought about it and he prayed about it and he wrote about it. He actually wrote a uh, memoir called The Seven Story Mountain. And it, it is a classic of 20th century devotion literature and with something to be, to be thought of and, and uh, checked in on. I would, I would recommend it. In his uh, later writings, he, he talked about the time that he gave up that life, that gave, that gave up his life before the monastery, but also, in a way, had to give over his writing life. It happened in February of 1957, and in one of his later writings, he wrote this, "'Yesterday morning I made my will.'" You always make a will before solemn vows, getting rid of everything as if you were about to die. It sounds more dramatic than it really is. As a matter of fact, as soon as I renounced all earthly things, I was called into the Father Abbot's room. The Father Abbot was the one who was the head of the monastery. I was called into his room, and he presented me with a contract from Harcourt and Brace for the publication of the Seven Story Mountain. So after making my will, I put my living signature on this contract. Merton gave over his life, his income, his, his resources to God in one form or another. He gave over his writing life so that all that was done would be provided and shared um, by the Lord. He lost that ability to walk around the world as he wished to be part of that community. And he spent the rest of his life serving in that way, in that place, and traveling on their behalf around the world. We give up something at about the time we want to enter into something else. God shows up in moments in the wilderness. God shows up when we are asked to think about what God's purposes may be for us. God shows up in times of challenge and difficulty. After natural disasters, there are often questions that are raised about why God would allow such things to happen. Some people find in these circumstances, reasons to not believe in God, in any God, much less the God that we know through Jesus Christ. But Scripture offers us these two directions. When things may seem to be going well, when we are minding our own business, doing our own things, when we are out there attending to the sheep of our flock, God shows up. And God has a challenge. Just ask Moses. When we have the right answers for the really tough questions in life, then we begin to listen more intently, and we discover that maybe the right answers are going to take us to places that we really didn't want to go. And if we say that we don't want to go there, then we may get called out. Just ask Peter. No doubt there are destructive powers in the world. Nature is extremely, uh, has all sorts of moving parts, and the, the fury of nature has been seen in many ways. The life of faith is to find our way through all of these circumstances and challenges and to find ways and to express ways of sharing faith, hope, and love. We do that in the norm, normal, ordinary course of events, and we also do that even when we are engulfed with disaster. 
20 years or so ago, um, my family moved to Atlanta. And about three months after we moved to Atlanta, a tornado came down our street, literally. Not just our street, but it, it, it cut a wide swath from Cobb County all the way over into, into Gwinnett County. Some of you in, in this room know what a tornado does because you experienced those, th those things here in Columbus, or you may have experienced other such storms in other places. Any number of you may have lived through hurricanes or other forms of natural disasters. They are not pleasant things, and they are each in their own way, their own um, crisis. As a result of that tornado, the church where um, I was serving at the time worked with other churches and local synagogues to f provide some interfaith disaster response. And one of the things we did was we collected prayers and um, writings to offer to families, to offer some support and encouragement. Uh, for that purpose, I wrote down some of my own thoughts, which is, it's sort of like a prayer, it's sort of like a poem, but I offer it today for you. The insurance company called it an act of God. The weather report said it was the finger of God. O oh Lord, I know that it was not your hand that brushed this place. It was not your foot that stomped on houses like a merciless giant. Two days later, I saw your desire for human life, cresting a hill where before 50,000 trees had stood, there was a vista of destruction. Amidst the destruction were hundreds, even thousands of angels, working, sweating, pulling out debris, salvaging what could be saved, throwing away what couldn't. How did I know that they were angels? I heard the flutter of their wings and the whine of the chainsaws. This week as I've watched the news from Texas and Louisiana, I've heard a lot of other whines, I've heard of a lot of other angel wing flutters. Some of them have been the sound of monster trucks, some of them have been the sound of airboats, some of them have been just a good old bass boat that has gone in and relieved and lifted up. But even as the helicopters and the boats and all the flotation devices have brought people out, there will be times for people to go back. God shows up in moments like that. And God shows up on the ongoing, continuing basis of life. God showed up for Moses in the wilderness. God showed up for Peter as Jesus talked about the cross, God shows up for you and me at any other number of times and places in life. The hymn we sang for the verse for, uh, for the hymn for illumination was open my eyes that I may see. The other verses go open my ears that I may hear. Open my mouth that I may tell. Let us be aware of where God is by opening our eyes to see what is around us, opening our ears to hear what we can know, and opening our mouth to share that in this place and wherever we can. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Having heard the word properly read and proclaimed, let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and set it on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Lord God, we know you as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are not just anyone. You are the one God. You have made us in your image so that we are not just anyone, but we are your ones. By your presence and power, you have created, redeemed, and sustained the world, and we praise you for the goodness and the wonder of creation that gives us life and hope and breath. We give thanks for the steadfast love, and we pray that your presence will come into this world for those who suffer and for those who are not. We ask your special concern for those who are the survivors of disasters this day, especially those in the wake of Harvey and in the flooding in South Asia. We pray especially as the rivers crest, as the storms end, as we live and move through this time, so many emotions flood over us and flood over those individuals. We pray that there will be a way to find some peace, that some anxieties are quieted, that some of the angers, some of the feelings of anger are met. Help us to know that you do not desert us despite our feelings. Help those in the wake of these storms know this too. Through your Holy Spirit, may we know that you work together in all things for good. We believe that through you, love may overcome hatred, joy will overcome sorrow, and good will overcome evil. Help us to see your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your Spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Through our eyes and ears and hearts, may we see what you would have us see and feel. Direct our thoughts so that we may be your agents in the world. We rejoice that in life and death, we belong to you. And as we trust you, help us by your spirit to pray. Hear our request, those that have been spoken and those that we have in our hearts and those that are deep down rumbling around inside, which are hard to form even yet. We give it all to you. Receive it so that it may do the good you will make it to do. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Scripture reminds us, do good and share what you have. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Thank you, Lord, for all that is good in the world. Thank you for ways in which we share in the wonder of your creation and your love. May our response of gratitude be an offering of substance and hope for this time and place. Amen.
God shows up. So open your eyes, open your ears, and open your hearts to those places where that will happen for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you and be with you. May it be with you as you breathe in and as you breathe out. May it accompany you with every step you take and every stride you make this day and always. Amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.